Hello and welcome to the first video from Clydebridge Station in 2022 and first of all a very happy new year to all of you. At the time that this video first went live on YouTube the 5th of January 2022 it was also a very important anniversary in the running of the railways here in Britain because 5th of January 2022 marked 40 years since sectorisation began on Britain's railways and the purpose of this video is to go and look at what sectorisation was, why it was created and what the sectors were. Now during this video you'll, you'll hear me making lots of um, phrases and mentioning various names. It must be mentioned that there are a couple of societies and organisations that are associated with the sectors and they're on Facebook as well and if you do a search you will eventually uh, <coughs> find them using an internet search engine. There are very, there are quite a lot of railway societies that whilst not associated with sectors do happen to have rolling stock painted in a sector's livery as well. There's too many to mention but nevertheless um, again a, an in, putting the details into your internet search engine will I would imagine bring up what you're after. <coughs> to get an understanding of what um, sectorisation was all about we need to first of all wind the clock back to 1948 British Rail was created, uh, sorry, was run by the British Railways Board, which was created uh, and began operations in January 1948 as a, na a nationalised industry, taking over um, all the main passenger lines and freight lines run by the Big Four in Britain. It did not take over the lines in Northern Ireland, which are now operated as Northern Ireland Railways by Translink, nor did it take over other operations such as those of the Liverpool Overhead Railway closed 1959 or the Glasgow Subway which passed to Strathclyde Passenger Transport Executive in 1974 nor did it take over uh, any heritage lines that may have existed or lines in the Channel Islands or the Isle of Man. It also did not take over the running of the London Underground or the lines of the London Passenger Transport Board, now TFL. However, in the case of the, the London Underground, there was joint running with London Underground on certain areas, such as the Metropolitan north of Harrow on the Hill or the Bacon Loo line north of Queen's Park. In order to allow the operations of British Rail to be uh, done on a manageable sized basis, the operations had to be broken down into workable sized chunks and this was initially regions and there were six regions which came about more by accident and chance than by design, later reduced to five and then increased again in 1988 to six, although as you'll soon see the, the 1988 change was more of a paper exercise and it didn't really affect passengers. The six regions were the Scottish region, which took over all the Scottish operations of both the LMS and the LNER. The northeastern region, which took over all the operations in the northeast of the LNER. The eastern region, which took over all the lines south of York and in Anglia, forming that of the LNER which then, in 1964, the eastern region was expanded when it absorbed the northeastern region. And in 1988, the eastern region lost the lines in Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex to the Anglian region. There was also the London Midland region, which took over the, all the English and North Wales operations of the LMS. The western region which took over all the lines belonging to the Great Western Railway. 
and finally the southern region which took over all the, the lines belonging to the southern railway which include the Waterloo and City Line and the Isle of Wight. There were various territory changes during the regionalisation era. For instance, in 1965, the lines west of Salisbury were moved from the southern to the western region. In the, the late 60s, the lines from Fenchurch Street northwards to Lakes of South End, which had hitherto been part of the LMS, were moved more logically into the eastern region and then in 1988 to the Anglin region. There were also various boundary changes around the Birmingham area in the late 60s as well. <coughs> of course in the 60s the main change was the, the transfer of the northeastern region into the eastern region. During the 1970s passenger transport executives were created and these uh, had to work with British Rail and former corporation bus companies which were now put under the control of the PTEs along with um, nationalised operators belonging to the Scottish Bus Group in Scotland or the National Bus Company in England and these wanted some clout in, with British Rail there was also a concern from some local authorities that the regions of British Rail were only concentrating and putting their main focus onto the main lines and, and there was no management for hitherto smaller lines. There was also a concern that freight customers were not getting the full benefits that they should have been getting. Therefore, under a plan uh, instigated by the then Labour government in 1977 that wanted to see the certain aspects of the railway pay its way, i.e. without subsidy, the then chairman of British Rail, Sir Peter Parker, introduced a new style of management for the railways. And this was called sectorisation. And there were to be five business sectors, which were revenue earning, and there would be one more sector, uh, the civil engineering sector, which we'll explain to you now a little bit more later. The idea was that the regions would still exist, but these would no longer own the rolling stock, would no longer manage the stations, and they would no longer um, decide upon fares and scheduling on marketing. The regions would now become production services, providing what the, re the sectors wanted. And there were five business sectors created. Parcels and freight had obviously been seen as two distinct areas of operation and parcels and freight therefore made up the two non-passenger carrying business sectors. Parcels sector adopted this livery in 1990, being the last of the business sectors to adopt a livery, later changing its name to Rail Express Services, or sorry, Rail Express Systems in 1991. There was also Rail Freight. This livery here is actually from Rail Freight's um, relaunch in 1987, and it's Rail Freight Metals. There were three passenger carrying sectors as well. The high speed long distance passenger carrying trains were branded Intercity. Indeed, the name Intercity had been first used in 1966 uh, between Euston and Birmingham Wolverhampton. So, Intercity took on all of the high speed trains last of which were delivered in 1982 and adopted what was called the executive livery which is actually seen here on 08673 but in 1987 adopted this swallow livery which in my opinion is the best livery a 47 has ever carried. <coughs> if you lived within an 80 mile radius of London then the name uh, Network South East would have been familiar after 1986 the 1982 reorganisation created the London and South East sector. It sporadically applied a Jaffa cake cliver to some of its rolling stock. Uh, some three Class 309 electric multiple units working between Liverpool Street and Clacton, some 411 force seps and a couple of motor luggage vans. But after the 
the relaunch 1986, it became Network Southeast. Other provincial services which became in 1991 Regional Railways was the third passenger carrying business sector and it basically operated the social railway as it were. In Scotland it was known as ScotRail, a brand that still exists to this day in the privatisation era. Regional Railways adopted a couple of different liveries during its time including this one that you see here uh, which comes from the 1991 rebrand. It also marketed some names for a while such as TransPennine. The last business sector, or the last sector, is not a revenue earning sector, but it was the civil engineering department which later adopted this Dutch style livery. I must mention as well, by the way, that the civil engineering department was done on a regionalised basis and it basically done what the sectors wanted it to do. As mentioned already, the staff at first at depots, drivers, stations all remained with the regions. Indeed, the London and the South East sector, when it began on the 5th of January 1982, the only people directly employed by it were a team of 30 based at Waterloo Station. Over the years, the idea of the sectorised railway meant that the Intercity was to try and turn a profit and by 1988 it did and it operated without any subsidy from the government. Rail freight after a few years of losses ended up turning into a very profitable business indeed 21 million pound I believe one year. And parcels was seen as a very distinct area and it started to make a profit too although it did suffer a blow in 1988 with the ending of the newspaper trains when haulage companies switched to road. This was actually partly borne out by um, the, the decision by News International to move to Wapping in 1986 and to switch to road as a way of getting around the uh, possibility of pickets after the controversial move. However, it has to be said that with newspaper sales falling in general, it's questionable even today if newspaper trains would have actually survived into the 90s. As shown, parcel sector's main customer was the Royal Mail. <coughs> the, the business sectors were free to introduce their own liveries, subject to approval by the BR design panel. And that's why you see, for instance, we've got a good transition here, we've got 47436 at the buffer stops. And just next to it, you can just make out 47461 and it's Blue Stripe Scott Rail Livery. A sign that uh, things were changing. The idea behind the liveries was for each sector to market its own identity and services and also meant that depots could take pride in what was their rolling stock. Sectorisation saw locomotives, coaching stock, etc being allocated to specific depots to specific duties and one actual interesting turn in all of this was that <coughs> with locomotives um, always returning to their home depot on a more frequent basis and being tightly controlled by the sectors it actually led to a reduction in the number of locomotives needed. Sectorisation was a a very good success story and the regions um, were contracted by the sectors to provide what they wanted and two main success stories came out of it. The creation of the Thameslink in 1988 would have been impossible under just a regionalised basis uh, crossing from the LMR to the southern but under Network South East, they just ignored the regional boundaries and the two regions had to do what the, the sector wanted and they created the Cross London Thameslink service which diverged away near St Pancras to serve Farringdon, later also City Thameslink and up to Blackfriars providing a Bedford and Luton to Brighton service, also serving Gatwick Airport. 
Another success story by sectorisation was of course the East Coast Mainline Electrification which was sponsored by Intercity, although the seeds for that had actually been sown after the bedpan electrification of 1982 and the, even further before that the Hartford North to King's Cross and Moorgate electrification of 1975-76. Intercity sponsored this project uh, which saw the wires going up from Hartford North all the way through to Edinburgh and Provincial also sponsored the electrification from Glen to North Berwick as part of that. Electric services began running in 1989 from King's Cross to Leeds and the whole shebang was opened to electric trains two years later in 1991. It involved two regions and it involved a, a lot of working together but it brought out a very successful project indeed. Sectorisation, uh, as I say, saw the regions working as production services for the sectors but in late 1990 the then chairman Bob Reid at British Rail and now sectorisation would be made complete with the production staff transferring from the regions to the sectors. As an example, Network South East went from having just 300 staff to about 25,000 staff. The value of its assets and turnover sought become the 15th biggest company in Britain. And indeed, Network South East, like the other business sectors, took on the staff, the stations, which we now directly owned rather than managed, and the track. Each uh, line would be allocated a prime user, so the East Coast Main Line, for instance, Intercity would be the prime user. The lines out of Fenchurch Street, Network South East would be the prime user. The lines out of Glasgow Queen Street, Regional Railways would be the prime user. Other users, um, other business sectors, could access the lines and would have to pay the prime user for the access. And by 1991 the sectorisation was complete and the regions were finally abolished. Now I mentioned about the Anglia region and in 1988 it was created um, by a split from the eastern region. But this was only really a, a change of management for staff and passengers were completely unaffected by it. The, Sectorisation was well underway by then, so the intercity and networks of these services out of Liverpool Street and any regional railway services and freight parcel services were, there was just no change to them, it was just a simple case of a change of location of management from York to London. The regions uh, now being finally abolished, the sectors therefore uh, dealt with everything directly. There were a few things that were still left, like the Civil Engineering Department, which still carried on in its own way, but in reality the sectors called all the shots. <laughs> Obviously this layout is set in the sectorisation period in 1990, and so we won't go into the privatisation part of it, except to say that the network rail today operates um, the track and that on a regionalised basis, similar but not identical to the old BR regions. <coughs> just briefly mention to uh, again about going each sector in detail, and it's worth just mentioning too that there is a video, Meet the Sectors, which goes into this further as well. But basically, rail freight carried all the rail freight uh, products, it, it dealt with all its freight customers. Created in 1982, it of course uh, initially had a large local grey livery before adopting this livery in 1987, the subsector livery. <coughs> Five subsectors, metals, as seen here, metals and automotive, distribution, coal, petroleum, construction. Provincial rebranded as Regional Rail was in 1991 and it carried and dealt with all the passenger traffic for short to medium distance services 
with it except going uh, out of London. Provincial services did cross into the London and South East sector occasionally, such as the Cardiff to Brighton service, or the service from Southampton to Bristol, but in the main it didn't actually venture into central London. Provincial also operated uh, a large variety of rolling stock, but later on adopted mainly sprinter units. And it was them that would oust trains such as the one that you see there. Rebranded in 1991 as Regional Railways, it moved its headquarters to Birmingham. Parcel sector, as already mentioned, dealt with mail and parcels traffic. Rebranded in 1991 as Rail Express Systems, it later took on charter train traffic, taking that over from Intercity. And Intercity, of course, had all the glitz and glamour with the high speed trains. Intercity uh, was, in, it was broken into various subsectors, such as Great Western, London to Norwich which also looked after the Gatwick Express, I should add, East Coast, West Coast, Cross Country. And there was lastly, of course, Network South East, which was originally the London and South East sector, and it dealt with commuter traffic and local to medium traffic on an 80 mile radius um, around London. It included the Isle of Wight and the Waterloo and City Line. I must mention that Network South East Territory spanned as far as Manning Tree and also spanned, interestingly enough, as far as Exeter Central. These business sectors may be long gone, but it has to be said that it was these business sectors and this idea of sectorisation that was to actually turn the fortunes of British Rail for a good while in the 80s. And had privatisation not happened, and I, since I have to admit I wish it didn't happen, these sectors would still be around today, and it would be fascinating to see how they would have dealt with the challenges of the 90s and beyond. I'm pretty sure they would have done a fantastic job. Now, of course, there are other layouts that are set in the sectorisation era, and two of, and three of them I'll actually mention to you are Warham. Warphampton, sorry. This is an engaged layout set in the Network South East um, Territory. There's Everard Junction, which is also set in the Network South East Territory, at a fictional location on the Great Western Main Line. This is double O gauge, and then there's my good friend David Watson with the Dean Park Station, which, like mine, is set in the Scottish region in Scotrail territory, although I would hazard a guess that David Watson, you as a man who loves class 47s like me, I don't think you've got a class 47 yet carrying a um, real freight triple grey subsector livery. I can actually beat you on that because if you actually happen to notice folks, the locomotive liveries of each of the five business sectors and the civil engineering department are represented before your eyes. There's quite a few books about um, when it comes to dealing with sectorisation. You can hunt for these on various bookshops or internet auction sites. And you can also check out, um, look for likes of Motive Power Monthly, a magazine that was produced between 1985 and 1991 and its predecessor, Modern Railways Pictorial. Check them out as well because they dealt with the sectorisation period. And there's also older editions of Modern Railways magazine, which you can have a look at and see if you can uh, check out the sectorisation period there. Well, that brings to an end this video, a very unusual video, uh, just me blethering for 20 odd, 25 minutes, but um, 40 years of sectorisation. So let's see, anybody got uh, a layout set in the sectorisation period of BR? Let's hear about it, and let's see it, and I'm sure it'll be great. The next video you'll see will be the January 2022 update, when you'll see quite a few changes 
And there's going to be something happening here, thanks to Railway Modeler magazine. Anyway, we'll see you for that. And happy 40th sectorisation. Bye-bye for now.